Hi everyone, hello and welcome. So I want to respond to this question. Whoops, <laughs> let's respond to this question. Why does minimum wage reduce consumer surplus in the labor market? So think about our definition of consumer surplus. It is the difference between the willingness to pay and the actual market price. So think about something you'd be willing to buy, think about how much you'd, willing, you'd be willing to pay for it, how much it's worth to you, and then think about how much you're actually required to pay. The difference is your consumer surplus. And so that would be like on one unit you would buy, and then across each unit you'd have some consumer surplus. We'd aggregate this up across all consumers, and that would give us graphically the area under a demand curve. Right? So graphically, consumer surplus area under the demand curve and above the market price. Remember, we think of theory of demand as a theory of marginal benefit. The height of the demand curve is going to give us the marginal benefit of consumers. Indeed, the vertical intercept is going to give us the marginal benefit to the highest valuation consumer. This is going to be the, willingness to, the highest willingness to pay in this market. And then the horizontal intercept gives us the valuation, the lowest marginal benefit of our lowest valuation consumer. It would be the person who would only accept this good for free. Right. Okay, so graphically, the area under the demand and above the price, consumer surplus is often the area of a triangle, one-half base times height. Okay, producer surplus is the difference between the price and the cost to the firm. So it's how much they get from buyers minus what did it cost them to produce, and then across the unit sold. So graphically, producer surplus is the area under the price and above the supply curve. Why supply? Well, remember, theory of supply is the theory of marginal cost. Whereas the height of the demand curve is the willingness to pay or the benefits to consumers, the height of the supply curve is the marginal cost to sellers. Again, computed one-half base times height. So what about the labor market? So remember, in the labor market, our buyers are firms and our sellers are workers. Usually, and in most markets, right, our demanders are people and our suppliers are firms. Well, it's better to think of ordinary demand and ordinary supply and of labor demand and labor supply as having demand pertaining to buyers and supply pertaining to sellers. Then in the labor market, our demanders are our buyers of labor and our suppliers are our sellers of labor. So our buyers of labor are firms hiring workers and our sellers of labor are workers selling their time. So graphically, consumer surplus in the labor market is going to be the area under the labor demand curve and above the price. This price has a special name, wage, right? So the equilibrium wage, um, in this case, W star, and the equilibrium quantity uh, of jobs offered and filled is right here. I could have labeled this as Q star. And then producer surplus is the area under the price and above the cost curve. In this case, labor supply, right, costs to uh, workers would be like the opportunity cost of their time. It'd be like corresponding to the minimum price at which you'd be willing to work, right? Consumer surplus, right here, this is the value that firms are getting from hiring workers. Producer surplus, this is the value that consumers are, are is the value that workers are getting from, from agreeing to work. Okay, so consumer surplus is going to be the area under the demand curve, labor demand, and above the price. In this case, suppose we impose a minimum wage. Well, consumer surplus is this little pink triangle, right? Ordinarily, consumer surplus would have been this larger triangle under the labor demand and above the wage. It's now shrunk when we increase the minimum wage, right? What's happened, we have a smaller quantity demanded and a smaller quantity traded. So anytime you impose a price on a market, it's nice to run over to the curves and see what we have for quantities. Okay, so at this, at this price, W lower bar indicating a binding price floor, our quantity demanded at this binding price floor, at this binding minimum wage, is right here. Our quantity supplied at this binding minimum wage, this binding price floor, is here. Quantity supplied at W lower bar. Okay, so we have QD is the quantity of jobs offered at the minimum wage. QS is the quantity of labor supply, the number of workers who are willing to work. More people are willing to work than jobs available. So the total number employed is going to be this right here. This is corresponding to the quantity demanded, right? The quantity actually traded is whichever is the smaller of quantity demanded and quantity supplied in any market, right? Here would have been our equilibrium, jobs offered and accepted, because this binding minimum wage or binding price floor, binding minimum wage, we have a smaller quantity actually traded. This reduces surplus in the market, meaning the firms buying labor are getting less value. Okay, so now there's something else interesting to explore. And that's that, maybe you notice, there's a difference between quantity supplied and quantity demanded, and that corresponds in this market to unemployment. So there are workers who would like to work, but are unable to work. Although we don't care about all these people the same way, 
right? There's something different going on. So first, let's think about the number of people who have jobs and are employed and were employed before. So at the equilibrium price, right, these people, Alta Q star, would have had jobs and been employed at the equilibrium wage. When the minimum wage is imposed, we get a higher price, we get a change in price, causes a change in quantity demanded. So we walk, we move up the labor demand curve to a smaller quantity demanded. Right here in this black squiggle, this is corresponding to the to employment. These are the workers who kept their job and got wage, got raises, right? So these are the workers who are actually better off as a result of the minimum wage. These people are pretty happy, right? They were employed before at this wage. Now they're employed at this wage. That's good for them. So these people are pretty happy with the raised minimum wage. What about these people in the green? They're not as happy, right? So these are jobs that are lost. These are, jo these are workers who are no longer hired. Um, at the higher wage, right? So these individuals have lost their wage, or lost their, lost their income, have lost their jobs, therefore no longer paid a wage. What about this right here, this grayish, grayish squiggle? Well, these individuals are unemployed, but they couldn't be troubled to work at this wage. They are only interested in working now at this more attractive wage, right? Think of the labor supply as corresponding to their opportunity cost. They have judged the people who are corresponding between Q star and QS, they correspond to this portion of the labor supply curve. These individuals, their opportunity cost of their time, they like leisure too much. They're just not willing to work at W star. But by the time we get to this W lower bar, this higher minimum wage, like, oh yeah, now I'll work. Okay, so now they've got to look and see if they can find a job. This is corresponding to jobs that are not filled. Okay, so these are those who are unemployed but, did, but didn't lose their job, but they wouldn't work anyway. I mean, these, these uh, uh, these jobs would not be filled anyway. Actually, I probably should have said these are jobs that would not be filled anyway. I shouldn't say so much about workers because possibly some of the people who had higher opportunity costs and weren't willing to work here might be, I don't know, maybe they're more skilled or, or better workers and some of them are actually going to outcompete maybe some of these um, other individuals for those jobs because at the higher wage, the firm is able to be more selective with who they hire. That's a complication. Let's not worry about that for now. Let's just think about unpacking the difference between the two types of groups who are unemployed. Those who lost jobs and are called, what maybe they refer to this as disemployment, and those who did not, those jobs that were not lost. Okay, so then I say relative sizes of these three groups uh, depend on the relative labor, and, labor demand and labor supply elasticity and on how far W lower bar is from the equilibrium, right? So the relative size of these things depend on um, how, how extreme the minimum wage is relative to the prevailing equilibrium. Uh, that's the one thing that's going to determine the relative size of these things. And then also the relative labor demand and um, labor supply elasticity. And so as we're analyzing the effect of a given minimum wage change, one of the things we might be interested in is, have we helped these workers more than we've hurt these workers? And so it's, there's a normative question in there, but I've asked this in terms of a positive question, in terms of surplus. Have we helped these workers more than we've hurt these workers? We could actually study this empirically and get a, and get a sense for a given situation. Um, is the gain, in terms of lost and gained value, larger for those who are employed and have gotten raises um, than those who have lost their job. And you could, you could quantify those results. Then you get into the sort of normative territory. We have to figure out like, you know, how large does the gain to those who have gotten raises compared to the law, those who have lost their job need to be before we think this is a good idea. And of course, there's all kinds of different arguments about minimum wage being sort of a really um, uh, difficult, sort of difficult way to target charity. And there's a lot of interesting things to explore. Here, the economics are giving us a starting point for all of those debates. So we can just think about how we can identify gains and losses um, to particular consumers and con particular producers of labor. Consumers of labor being firms and producers of labor being, uh, being workers. Indeed, these firms right here, corresponding to the labor demand, they have lost, right? They would have been able to hire these workers. No longer are they able to, f to fill those jobs, right? Or they can't offer those jobs. Okay.